So hi, I'm Thor Erickson. Uh, I am Managing Director at BC Workshop. And I just want to thank you all for coming out today um, to hear the State of da Dallas Housing um, presentation. Uh, this really looks at data from last year. Uh, it's presented this year as a, as a look back and a way to uh, really look at a snapshot of housing um, affordability in Dallas. It's something we're going to strive to uh, produce every year um, as a way to, to capture this information and present it out publicly. And you'll hear more about that later um, from Thomas as he gives the presentation. Uh, but BC, we are a Texas-based community design center seeking to improve the livability and viability of communities through the thoughtful practice of design and making. Uh, essentially, we work across topic areas like affordable housing or data, community engagement, social justice, and equity. Uh, and we, we do that um, with a very talented staff. Uh, a lot of them are in the audience tonight. Um, so we have Lisa and Bernardo and Owen and Patrick and Thomas and Amruta. Um, and, and really our staff is comprised of architects and planners, uh, data people, geographers, storytellers. Craig is in the back, he's filming this tonight as part of our um, BC Media Project so that we can continue to make events like this accessible past just tonight. Um, you know, we really strive to make sure the, the work we do is very open and public. Um, and, and you know, we do that across Texas. We have a, an office here in Dallas. We have an office in Houston and Brownsville. We recently launched an office in, in D.C. That's us planting our B.C. flag in D.C. because we're silly like that. Uh, but the topics, you know, really differ from geography and the staff we have in each location vary uh, based on the needs of the type of projects that we're doing. Uh, but tonight, uh, we're here to hear about Dallas. Um, so we thank you all for coming. Um, and I do want to introduce... Um, one person before Thomas, and that's uh, Annie Lord. She is Vice President at Citibank uh, and Community Development Officer. Uh, she has her undergrad and her postgrad in political and economic development from Harvard. Um, she's been with Citi since 2012, but prior to that, she worked in nonprofit development and leadership in DC and Miami. And uh, she was also a front woman for an 80s cover band. So if we're lucky, we might hear some of that later. But uh, without further ado, Annie. Okay, well, thanks, Thor. Um, thanks, all of you, for taking an interest in being here. Um, and I just wanted to tell you a little bit about why City has invested with um, BC Workshop, and particularly for work like you'll hear about tonight. Um, city community development invests in making cities more inclusive. So what do we mean by that? Um, we're really specific, actually. Um, an inclusive city is one where all residents have access to the resources they need at an affordable price to be economically mobile and our economy resilient. Um, so uh, I think as Thomas will present, um, we're kind of lagging on this score here in Dallas. We suffer from um, high income inequality um, uh, and asset uh, in inequality as well. Um, so in this barbell economy, um, we're seeing, we have got great wealth, um, but we've also got rapidly expanding poverty. So um, from 2000 to 2012, we saw a 40% increase in the families suffering in, uh, from poverty. Um, and we also saw in roughly that time uh, the number of census tracts in our city with high concentrations of poverty, we saw that grow from 18 to 38 census tracts. So um, the recession is really still very alive, unfortunately, in our, um, in our city today. So one of the symptoms of that high income inequality is that we have uh, really a low home ownership rate in this city. It's only at 43%, and most experts would agree that uh, a healthy city has closer to 55, 65% home ownership. Um, and as Thomas is gonna present, uh, moderate income and middle income people who make up you know, what you might consider a middle class are really not buying in the city of Dallas. So we're missing um, a major component of residents um, that undergirds a resilient economy, and that's the middle class. So how do we get a middle class, more of a middle class, living here inside the city limits. Um, first, we need to help lower income people become more economically mobile, right? 
and partially that's through home ownership opportunities. Um, second, we want to attract more moderate and middle income people to purchase in Dallas, move into Dallas. So a couple of years ago, I mean maybe three years, um, City, myself and, and others um, uh, began a conversation with BC Workshop and uh, many other partners across the city um, to discuss and identify what are the gaps in the system of purchasing a home. Um, what are the gaps that prevent us from having more of that middle class, you know, buying homes here? Um, and we found that the gaps were, you know, system-wide, right? We have, uh, you know, that from the uh, lack of really a strong pipeline of qualified borrowers who can become homeowners, um, to a mismatch between lenders and borrowers, um, to really a paucity of, um, you know, quality, affordably priced homes in neighborhoods of opportunity, and then uh, policies that really could do better to support development of homes in neighborhoods of opportunity. So um, what resulted from all of that research was AIM for Dallas, which is what you're going to hear about today. Um, and I'm going to introduce Patrick Blades um, from BC Workshop to talk about AIM for Dallas. So uh, let me be the third person then to welcome you guys here tonight. Uh, thanks for coming out. Uh, I, uh, my name is Patrick Blades. I'm the housing associate here at BC Workshops. Uh, as Annie was talking about, uh, you know, a conversation about how we can further uh, affordable housing uh, and middle income housing here in Dallas. You know, they've, uh, those conversations have been going on for about three years. It uh, resulted in this, uh, the program, uh, the AIM for Dallas, the affordable info uh, model for Dallas. <laughs> Uh, and to address some of the issues that Annie was talking about, uh, AIM, we came up with uh, really three core modules uh, for our program. The first uh, is the navigation part. Uh, the navigation part uh, speaks to part of that issue that Annie was talking about where uh, you had people who were unable, interested home buyers who were una unable to buy a home here in Dallas for whatever reasons. They weren't able to connect with a the lender, they weren't able to find the right neighborhood, they weren't able to find the right house. And the navigation part of AIM <laughs> Uh, seeks to remedy some of those solutions and close some of those gaps uh, to get more people who are just interested in buying a house here in Dallas uh, into the, one of those homes. Uh, the second uh, module is the research and analysis module. That's really what we're going to be focused on here tonight. Uh, again, that uh, seeks to seeks to input uh, a degree of research and policy analysis uh, to the affordable housing issue here in Dallas that maybe is a little bit lacking at this point in time. Uh, the first part of research and analysis is going to be the, uh, what we're doing here tonight. Uh, and we hope to continue that conversation, continue it uh, throughout this year. Uh, the last part is kind of the long range idea. It's the investment module. Uh, and that's something that came out of some conversations that, uh, you know, that, that again, were occurring for the past three years about how we can uh, further affordable, affordable housing here in, the, uh, here in Dallas uh, by maybe bridging some of those financial gaps that you have between uh, builders or, or, or lenders or developers uh, that right now are just looking for uh, additional capital to make some of these projects happen. Uh, and with that, uh, I will hand it off to uh, Thomas uh, to give our presentation tonight. Well, thank you guys all so much for coming. I'm glad to have you here. Um, we'll get into the uh, meat of our program here. Give me just a moment. It appears that my notes have disappeared. <laughs> Even take the notes from up there. Anyway, we can move on with that. Uh, <laughs> I, I sabotaged you. you sabotaged me, Annie. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, yeah, thank you guys all for coming. As you heard, this is a first uh, of an annual study that we're going to be doing on housing affordability uh, in the city of Dallas. Um, and we think that housing is such an important part of our economy, the lives of our citizens, and also um, in sort of the stability and health of our neighborhoods. Um, so the more we can understand about home ownership and strengthen it in the city of Dallas, the better we'll be. So there's three real reasons that we want to do this report and continue doing this report. Uh, it seemed like a couple of years ago uh, when the 
fair housing violations for the city came out. Uh, and we started sort of learning more about the, really the breadth of the poverty in the city that people were taken aback. Um, so we want to start tracking more of these metrics to, to keep a tab on, on really how the city is changing. Um, so we're not caught, you know, caught off guard so much. And uh, we can hold ourselves, people that are involved in housing and real estate and also the public sector accountable um, to how the city is changing. Um, one of the real things that we did here that I think is unique is starting to combine market and justice metrics. So um, we think that we can measure our success both by the growth in our tax base, but also by the increased opportunities uh, in the life of a low-income family. Uh, we don't think that those are incompatible in how we think about our city improving. Um, and we also just want to demonstrate uh, the utility of data and geospatial analysis and understanding how the city is changing in a way that can inform the investments that uh, the nonprofit sector, the public sector, and the private sector uh, make. So um, we're going to do a quick review of some of the things that have happened in Dallas in the last year. So one of the, one of the big things that motivated um, how we've shaped this Aim for Dallas plan was, uh, was Neighborhoods Plus, which I know many of you in the room are familiar with and were involved in. Um, it's a city of Dallas plan that, uh, here are some of the key ideas from it. Set a new direction and shape new policy for housing and neighborhood revitalization in Dallas. Um, create a strategic planning and decision-making framework to guide more effective community investment decisions. And among the strategic goals that are relevant here, alleviate poverty, fight blight, attract and retain the middle class, and expand home ownership. Uh, this, pass this plan was adopted by the City Council, and uh, we think there's a lot of really good concepts in that plan and some good ideas. Um, and we want to use some of the work here to urge that plan forward to accomplishing some of those, uh, some of those ideas. So um, there was some other big policy-related work this year. There was the Inclusive Communities Project versus Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs. Yes, that is a picture from Schoolhouse Rock in the background. Um, and uh, that, uh, that lawsuit went all the way to the Supreme Court, and uh, where the Supreme Court ruled that um, investing low-income housing tax credits in areas of concentrated poverty was furthering segregation. Uh, the Real Estate Council and Urban Land Institute also contributed uh, reports to the city of Dallas on uh, how to increase affordable housing and also affordable housing that uh, provided opportunities for families in the city of Dallas. And so the, the result that we're expecting is sometime this year the City of Dallas Housing Committee is going to formulate and hopefully pass a, a policy on affordable housing in the city. Now, really the common thread that I want to pull out of each of these, um, and it's uh, also, I think, relevant that we're here in this space because just down the street is where one of the large, larger arguments about um, dialogues about affordable housing in the city came about when uh, council member Philip Kingston uh, urged the developers of a, of a new project on Clyde Warren Park to include affordable units in their, in their project, which is that uh, we really have a need for mixed income and diverse neighborhoods in the city of Dallas and that choices in what type of neighborhood um, you want to live in need to extend to low-income and middle-income residents. Um, and we think that's really important and, and is a thread that you're going to see throughout here today. So there are four chapters we're going we're gonna to go through from this plan. There's uh, demographics and economy, which looks sort of at population and jobs and things like that in the city. Um, the market for home ownership, where we dig into MLS and mortgage data, barriers to, to home ownership, and opportunities and solutions. So uh, starting off with demographics and, uh, and economy, um, as a, a term that Annie pulled out that uh, we've heard a bit, we do know that Dallas is a barbell economy. Um, this is, uh, I think, something that uh, Mike Rawlings coined as far as it's concerned in Dallas. Um, We've got concentrated poverty, we've got concentrated wealth, um, not enough middle class. Now, the image is here is not to suggest that we need to rely exclusively on the middle class to lift this barbell and fix this problem. What we need um, is both figuring out how to uh, resolve some of the challenges facing our people in poverty so they can move into that middle class and also uh, making sure that those concentrations of, 
uh, extreme wealth become more diverse and equitable. Uh, so, um, one, one aspect of that barbell economy that is really striking is the spatial segregation of it. Um, and we'll, we'll take a look at that. And also we can see that uh, the city is starting to grow at an increased rate, which is an encouraging sign, but it's not always clear that, uh, it's not clear yet if that barbell is, is changing. So, uh, some of these maps may, uh, may be familiar to you, but I think that they're worth showing again here today. Here's poverty and census tract for four counties, <coughs> Dallas, Collin, Denton, and Tarrant, with Dallas outlined in the middle. We, we used the four counties throughout this report because I think it's really important to understand Dallas, not just within the city limits, but within more of a regional context so we can understand who we're competing against and what the challenges are in the region as a whole. And you can see, uh, you know, here we got Preston Hollow, and then, you know, over here, Lakewood, areas where there's, uh, poverty is virtually absent, which is great, but then you look further south and in East Oak Cliff and uh, parts of South Dallas, uh, we have poverty where nearly 80% of the people in those some of those neighborhoods uh, are living in poverty. Um, this uh, issue of spatial segregation continues when we look at uh, job density. So, uh, of course, there's uh, high concentrations of uh, jobs in the downtown area nearby. But you can sort of see if this is Preston Hollow here, you know, the access to jobs both along the <coughs> North Dallas Toll Road, out towards the airport, and downtown in the medical district, uh, really accessible to those areas, wealthier areas, and then in South Dallas, uh, really a, a, a dearth of uh, jobs and uh, not quite the same access. So um, we also know that the city is beginning to grow a little bit more. So this is looking at the last three years. And uh, the city's growth has increased each year. Um, and actually, our growth rate uh, as a city has um, started to come in line with some of our larger suburban neighborhoods. We're not necessarily going to keep pace with like po Prosper, where you know this growth rate here is like 300 percent or whatever, because it went from a cow field to a uh, to a city overnight. But but you can see Dallas's growth rate is is really on an upward trend. Um, but we have to make sure that that growth rate is is working to uh, make the city more equitable. So um, so far this barbell, just in the last few years, we haven't seen a whole lot of changes. Um, stagnant jobs in the southern sector. Um, the change in poverty sort of looks like a scatter shot. There's places that are getting wealthier. There's places where poverty is decreasing. Uh, and if we look at some of those concentrations a little bit, we can see uh, sort of Oak Lawn out towards this white spot is Love Field, West Dallas, the Cedars. Um, you know, those are areas where those changes in poverty uh, have a lot to do with gentrification and are not necessarily uh, due to changing income for existing residents. And so. Uh, as we move forward, we got to think about how we can harness those uh, increased uh, incomes to improve the local communities. So, uh, moving on to our, our next section, uh, the market for home ownership. Um, you know, for housing affordability to really sort of be competitive and have a place um, in uh, what is in some cases uh, a very serious, seriously booming housing market in Dallas. Um, I think the people that are participating in this conversation need to have an uh, increased focus on uh, market dynamics and to start looking at, at how the city is changing through a real estate lens to understand how to compete with uh, folks that maybe do not have housing affordability as a concern. So um, you know, we'll, the city also, I think, has, has a role to play here in really understanding what are the kinds of neighborhoods that both low-income and middle-income people want to live in and how can uh, we provide the opportunities to make sure that they thrive. So um, we asked three questions to kind of get at those ideas. First is, who's buying the homes? What kind of homes are they buying? And where are they buying the homes? So um, first question, who's buying the homes? And we're just going to sort of scratch the surface on this uh, as we're doing each of these sections. The, uh, if you've seen the report that we've got a couple of examples of here, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a much bigger document we're not going to be able to touch on each of the statistics today, but to start to get an idea of these questions. So uh, here are those four counties. Uh, this is using, using uh, more applicant-level data from the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act. So this data set, you can actually look at individual mortgage applicants, their identities you can't see, but um, and 
um, where they're applying for a mortgage in terms of census tract, the value, et cetera. Um, so we can see in, in Dallas, we've got a, you know, a higher concentration of, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is um, uh, as a percentage of area median income. So in Dallas, we've got a higher percentage of lower income folks buying homes and sort of this squished middle income group. Um, Dallas also has a, a significantly more racially diverse um, mortgage applicant pool than uh, elsewhere in North Texas. Um, now what kind of homes are these folks buying? So back to that barbell, we can see uh, quite a bit higher of a portion of those homes are half million dollars and above, um, but also a higher percentage are under $100,000. Now, um, I wanted to put these up here. These are two really dense, great charts that um, Bernardo Salazar from BC Workshop put together. Um, so this one is of the city of Dallas, homes sold in the city of Dallas in the year 2015. Now, uh, the circles, the size of the circles represents the number of home sales. The color, in pink we've got condos, in green we've got single family, in blue we've got townhomes. Um, and then each of these vertical groups is an era in which that home was built. And each of these horizontal ones are uh, square footage. So 3,000 square feet and above is, are these groups. Under 1,000 square feet is this group. So basically you can read the chart. In the bottom left-hand corner are smaller, older home sales. In the upper right-hand corner are Home, uh, homes that are newer and larger that were sold in the past year. So to help break it down, um, within each of these squares, uh, the y-axis is increasing value and number of days on market. So if we pick out this pink circle right here, that's uh, condos that were built in the last five years that are over 3,000 square feet. Um, and those uh, took forever to sell, over, uh, over 100 days on the market, and also um, were more than $2 million. So how many people want to bet that those represented are uh, just across the highway over here at Museum Tower? Um, but you can see in general, Dallas has, has a sort of big spread. I mean, we're a little heavy on, uh, on the older homes, particularly between uh, the 40s and the 80s, sort of that post-war boom is when a lot of those homes were built. But in terms of what's being sold, we have a pretty big spread, and, and there's a lot of uh, blue and pink kind of popping up here and also that are, you know, higher up on the value. So, you know, what sort of growing demand is there for condos and townhomes? And then if we compare this to Collin County, look at the difference between that. It's all shifted towards newer, bigger, mostly single family. So um, I encourage you guys to dig into these charts a little bit more. They're really interesting. They have a ton of good information on um, uh, what's being sold in North Texas. Um, and I think kind of the takeaway for tonight that we want to have here is how do we understand um, our housing market compared to the region to understand what is it about Dallas? You know, what are these different things that we offer that aren't necessarily available uh, in other parts of North Texas that we can harness to, uh, to, to gain and attract new residents? Uh, or on the flip side, you know, do we want to, are there opportunities where we try and imitate our suburban neighbors? I think the answer is more complex than either one of those two. But uh, So our final question is where are, uh, are the folks buying homes in Dallas? So um, we did, uh, well, I guess you know, location is so important in real estate, and we really wanted to understand um, at, a, at a neighborhood level uh, what do the housing markets look like. And um, uh, uh, how can we compare those neighborhood level housing markets to the region. So we did this uh, market heat analysis that took three metrics, median days on market, number of homes sold, median closing price. We aggregated it to the census tract, to the neighborhood level. Um, and these scores are not necessarily, necessarily saying something good or bad about a neighborhood housing market. Um, it's merely indicating sort of the level of demand there. So. Um, this first map is looking just at home sales in 2015. Um, the darker blue are the areas of greater demand. So uh, really, East Dallas and Lakewood and, of course, the northern suburbs. There are some pockets in Uptown and North Oak Cliff and also here in Mountain Creek in terms of the city of Dallas. Um, I think one of the things that are interesting, that's interesting here is 
So if this is Lakewood proper, um, pushing out to the other side of the lake to sort of the Peninsula neighborhood and um, um, Casa View, Casa Linda, have really, and all the way down to 30, this white line is 30 here, have really uh, seen an increase in demand or have had really strong demand uh, this year. And then uh, this second one, I think is a little bit more important for our conversation today. This is a trend. So this is looking at how those neighborhoods scored from 2010 compared to, um, how their, their score changed from 2010 to 2015 compared to the region as a whole. So you can see there's a lot more variation that we can dig into a little bit more. Um, wanted to zoom into the core a little bit here. So uh, you can see some of those highest levels of demand. Again, if this is Lakewood proper, this is pushing down towards 30 through like the Mount Auburn neighborhood. And Uptown <coughs> is also pushing out along Maple Avenue uh, towards uh, Love Field, which is here. And then if this is the farmer's market pushing out towards the Cedars and, and actually into sort of South Dallas Fair Park. So um, there's a couple important things that we want to we wanna think about here. I also want to uh, point to on this previous, uh, previous map in 2015 that sort of this uh, Preston Hollow North Dallas area doesn't have quite the same score that these East Dallas neighborhoods do. In part, you know, that that level of demand is, is held down by the exclusivity of the neighborhood. There's only so many homes to be sold and only so many buyers that can afford to live there. Um, and then if we look at, uh, at these neighborhoods, I think the important things that we need to take away from this is um, how do we open those more exclusive neighborhoods uh, to, uh, to incorporate those low and middle income uh, homeowners and also um, how do we take these trends where uh, some of that sort of exclusivity may be pushing out into more modest neighborhoods um, and ensure that we preserve affordable housing opportunities in those places? Um, let's see. So if we look at the trend, this is the combined map between the combining the trend and the 2015. You can see it's sort of back to the norm. There's um, heavy uh, demand in East Dallas and in North Dallas. So this is a quote from Neighborhood Plus uh, that I think is a big theme um, for AIM. Future home ownership, housing needs, especially for the moderate and middle income, are not as much of an issue of housing supply and more of an issue of neighborhood quality and desirability. Now that's something that came out a lot in our conversations about AIM, um, that we had a lot of trouble attracting um, home buyers to the neighborhoods in Dallas that were more affordable. Um, so um, those barriers come from low demand on one end and from exclusivity on the other. Now, we also know that uh, there's a long uh, and fraught history that uh, impacts some of the demand in those neighborhoods where the areas of concentrated poverty have come about as a result of racial and economic segregation, disinvestment, and facilitated sur suburbanization, which are things that we need to um, to be aware of as we as we move forward. So, um, some of the things that we want to do, we want to make sure that we're looking at those barriers that that prevent uh, neighborhood level demand. We want to look at them over time. So those include segregation, school quality, poverty, educational attainment, high rates of renters and vacancy. We all know this intuitively, but how do we start to measure that? Um, also, uh, although that quote suggested that the issues in Dallas were primarily focused on neighborhoods. We've also noticed that there are barriers for individual home buyers uh, participating in the Dallas housing market. So uh, issues regarding inequitable credit access by race, income, and geography. Um, so those are, those are issues that we need to keep in mind and work to alleviate over time. So some of the barriers for the city as a whole, uh, like we said, neighborhood conditions. This is looking at uh, vacant residential parcels and homes uh, that uh, the Dallas Appraisal District rates as being poor, very poor, or unsound. Uh, we can see some of those same neighborhoods that had low housing demand or areas where um, half or more of the residential parcels are vacant and, um, uh, and where as many as a quarter, you know, as much as a quarter plus of the homes are in um, poor or worse condition as rated by DCAD. So, um, those conditions we know are hampering uh, the ability to build and sell new homes there. Um, 
And one of the, the reasons to think about this, you know, on, on, the, on the short term, we want to think about how we can increase uh, openness of those more exclusive neighborhoods uh, to be places where middle and moderate income folks can choose to live. But we also really have to think about how to start to um, create a housing market in, in, these, um, in these neighborhoods that make it a place where more people are choosing to live as well. So um, some of those are sort of longer term solutions in terms of investing in schools, infrastructure, et cetera. Um, moving on to some of the barriers for buyers. Um, income appears to be a growing barrier for buyers in Dallas now. Probably a lot of this, uh, this relates to um, the lack of inventory that we have in North Texas. We've all seen how um, price increases have gone through the roof. And, and what this is doing is um, discouraging lower income folks from entering the housing market. So uh, you can also see it in a little bit more uh, sort of moderate income, that, that trend downward over time in terms of who's even applying for mortgages to try and enter into the housing market. Um, on this slide, this is an interesting slide where we can see that other than uh, the lowest income group here, the, the under 50%, it is harder, you're more likely to be denied a mortgage in Dallas County than in the other three counties that we've looked at. You're, you're more likely to be denied a mortgage if you earn more than $150,000 and are applying for the mortgage in Dallas than if you uh, earn um, 80 to 100 percent, or so, sorry, more than 150 percent AMI than if uh, you earn 80 to 100 percent AMI in Tarrant County. So um, figuring out what some of those barriers are that are preventing people of, of, of different income groups from being able to access a mortgage AMI in Dallas. Is what, What's that? AMI is what? Is. Sorry, AMI is uh, area median income. So it's a measure of uh, the median income across the region. So 150 percent AMI you know, would suggest a level of wealth when compared to the region. Um, and then sort of descending income from there. Um, so, so 100% is like 27,000, something like that, right? Uh, it should give people a... It's somewhat <coughs> more than that. It's like a 40, Yeah, 20, yeah. Um, I think this is a really interesting slide about um, credit access by geography and one that, that is sort of troubling um, when thinking about Dallas is currently segregated nature. So this is looking at, uh, this chart on the left is applicants under 50% AMI, so fairly low income um, uh, mortgage applicants, uh, don't, virtually don't at all apply for mortgages in neighborhoods. And this, uh, this uh, the x-axis here is looking at what percentage uh, a tract is, uh, what percentage minority a census tract is. So. Um, uh, these are uh, mostly white neighborhoods that uh, lower income folks almost don't at all try to participate in a uh, housing market in mostly white neighborhoods and are considerably more likely to be denied. These blue bars are um, percentage denied, are significantly more likely to be denied um, access to credit in those mostly white neighborhoods. On the flip side, um, wealthier applicants, you can see this trend going up, have a harder time uh, accessing credit in majority minority neighborhoods. Um, so essentially, if you're poor, it's harder to get uh, access in mostly white neighborhoods. <laughs> and on the flip side, unusually, if you're, if you're wealthier, uh, you are less likely to be given a mortgage in mostly minority neighborhoods. So I think that suggests some real problems with access to credit. Uh, in Dallas, and it's something that we need to, to work towards if we want to have that more diverse, equitable city. So, um, moving on to our, to our final chapter, uh, these are complex issues, uh, and we know that um, the Real Estate Council and uh, the Urban Land Institute and the City of Dallas and other folks are, are working hard and um, identifying tools that can be applied to, to helping alleviate some of the, the, um, the housing issues that we have in the city. Um, we know that there's lots of, lots of tools to be applied. Um, but in this section, we want to demonstrate uh, how, through understanding the barriers that we talked about, applying the expanded market understanding that we have, um, we can start to apply the right tools in the right ways uh, in the right geographies. So um, the most important thing that we need uh, 
I think from the city is, is, is a clear idea of what it is that we want to achieve. Our agenda would be that we need to achieve neighborhoods that have choices available to people of varying income levels. Um, and so this is kind of going to drive towards that. Um, there are two main things in this section, a suitability analysis, where uh, we map the city based on a series of criteria um, that would work towards achieving policy goals uh, that, that ought to geographically guide how we think about um, where to invest in housing affordability. And uh, the second is uh, four different types of strategies towards housing affordability or to how, to how we consider neighborhoods in terms of affordable housing. So integration areas where we can um, uh, accomplish a, a level of uh, economic diversity in um, fairly exclusive neighborhoods today. Preservation, how can we see where that gentrification and the, the sort of reach of the, of the market is extending in such a way that we can um, uh, predict where that's happening and try and uh, put in place some safety measures to make sure that those neighborhoods remain viable for low to moderate income people. Activation, places where there's not really a housing market that could use, uh, whether it's housing investment or it's other types of investment, a jump start to help make the neighborhood market ready. And then uh, places that um, have lots of opportunities that we can plan for more holistically because um, they're either larger in scale or, or further down the line. So um, using this uh, sort of uh, baseline from Neighborhood Plus, um, for what the city was trying to accomplish. They want to link housing service, housing to crucial services, including education, training, healthcare, and transportation. This, this directed our choosing of uh, seven criteria by which to map the city. So um, poverty, or low, areas of low poverty, access to rail, job centers, good schools, bus access, access to grocery stores, and access to affordable clinics. Each of these um, demonstrate the proximity to those um, and were scored based on the proximity to those. We then weighted each of those features based on um, which we thought were the most important to consider in terms of housing affordability. So we, we favored uh, areas that were in low poverty as places to, uh, to encourage more housing affordability and also um, uh, areas that were accessible to rail. And so uh, by weighting and overlaying these maps, this is what we get for the city of Dallas. Um, you can see there's uh, uh, a heavy, um, heavy dose of North Dallas in, in terms of what this suitability analysis suggests, but also points us towards areas in Southern Dallas where we think that housing investment is going to be more impactful for, uh, for the folks that, um, uh, for low to moderate income folks who are, who are trying to live there. What are, what are better opportunities in those areas? Um, so, we cross-referenced that suitability analysis with um, publicly owned land, um, which we think is an excellent asset to leverage in terms of uh, how, to, how to provide more of that housing affordability. Um, in some cases, you know, this is large tracts of valuable land that, that's owned by the city, DART, county, um, that are currently vacant or underutilized. So um, what we did was we took anything that scored a seven or above on the suitability analysis and isolated all the city owned land or publicly owned land um, that fell within those areas and started to look at them in terms of what we thought um, based on the market analysis that we looked at and those barriers, um, some things that different places and different strategies that could happen there. So I'm gonna run through a couple of these real quick. This one is right down the street. The city of Dallas owns uh, about an acre of land here uh, in Uptown, right by Woodall and the Maple Ruth Connection um, that is currently uh, unoccupied. This is a place that, uh, as you guys know, is high wealth, is exclusive, very hard to find affordable housing there. Um, is that a place that the city of Dallas might think, here's an opportunity to leverage a public asset to increase affordable options in a place that is currently inaccessible? Um, so that was a, an, an example of a place to integrate. In terms of preservation, this is a, a street, little street called La Estrella Plaza. Um, here's 8th Street. Jefferson Boulevard is right down here. Lake Cliff Park is sort of just off the map right here. So an area that um, uh, has historically been very modest, but we started to see uh, increased investment in 
The city owns 14 plots of land that are zoned townhome right here. Uh, I know that they actually got a, uh, I think you guys got a, a proposal to, to actually do something here recently, which would be great. Um, but while uh, if we look at the, the 2015 market score, it was low, it was a four out of 15, but the trend was an eight starting to move up. So how do we start to anticipate how that neighborhood's gonna change uh, in terms of demand and uh, make sure that we preserve those uh, options using this public asset to ensure affordability moving forward. Uh, here is the Jeffries Meyer neighborhood in South Dallas, Fair Park. Fair Park is right here. Um, this is the Fair Park Dart Station, Perry coming down to Cullum. Um, and as you can see, there's, a, uh, there's about 29 acres worth of publicly owned land uh, scattered throughout this area right here. Um, and this neighborhood scored high on the suitability analysis. It's, it's close to, there's a grocery store right down the street here. It's close to <laughs> transit. It's close to job access downtown. Um, but currently the market is pretty low. It scored a six. So uh, how do we take this large site and think about what are the investments that we can make there that are going to make it more attractive to, uh, to development in that area while ensuring that we can protect a level of affordability. And I know that there has been recently a, uh, an apartment complex, new apartment complex that was built right here, I think. Um, uh, so how can we encourage some of that growth in the area while also making sure that we account for the need for future affordability? Uh, and finally, this is you know the type of future planning that we might have where we can think holistically about what is the range of um, opportunities that we want to different income groups uh, in a neighborhood that's going to create an equitable and accessible neighborhood. Um, but that's also going to be successful in the market. And so this is the LBJ Skillman Dart Station. You can see there's a giant parking lot that is very rarely full. Uh, but the Dart also owns all of this other land here. Um, there has been some planning done for this as part of, um, I know the neighborhood up here has done, done, done a lot pushing for um, as the LBJ East project happens for the Skillman and Audelia intersection to be improved. Um, uh, but this is a tremendous public asset. There's 27 acres of DART owned land here that's highly underutilized. Um, so just as we move forward, what is the right way to plan for this area that ensures that affordability and affordable home ownership is part of it? Because this score is an eight on the suitability, uh, on the suitability and has a com pretty high combined score on those market heat analysis. So. Um, that's the, the end of the report. I go, hope you guys will keep in mind uh, the importance of tracking what's happening in housing in terms of preserving an equitable city. I hope you guys will keep an open mind and take back um, uh, the importance of diverse neighborhoods and neighborhoods of choice to the health of the city and to increasing that, that middle class. Um, and thank you again for coming. If you guys want to read the whole report, uh, you can visit our website. It's super easy to find from there, bcworkshop.org. And if any of you have more questions for myself or any of the other folks uh, from BC Workshop, we'll be hanging around for a while afterwards, or you can shoot me an email here. Um, thanks. You want to take public questions? Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's what I was actually supposed to say. I'm not eager to leave. Uh, if anyone has questions, I would be glad to answer them. Yes, sir. Your analysis seems to focus on forms of uh, owner-occupied housing. Correct. Does any of your research pertain to rental housing in terms of where is the city or most suitable for affordable rental housing? That was not something that we looked at this year. Uh, one of the charges of Aim for Dallas is um, focusing on home ownership, uh, particularly as, as a way to, um, to build wealth and to sort of grow stability in neighborhoods. Um, I know that a lot of the other folks in the city, whether it's the Real Estate Council, Inclusive Community Partners, or uh, the Urban Land Institute, have done more looking at rental housing. Um, we think it's a really important issue um, and in future years uh, may expand the scope of, of this report to include rental, but for the time being, we focused on, on uh, ownership. Yes, sir. I'm going to build you on a little bit on his question. It's not the premise that renters will never be able to carry the fiscal load it takes, especially from the tax break, what you actually pay for something else, to 
to run a city like Dallas. And, and that being said, on the issue of affordability, it appears to me that Dallas is about the only city in the region that's trying to address affordable housing. Do you have programs like what you all are doing in Frisco or McKinney? Because the other perception is that you have a lot of working poor people who live in, especially my part of Dallas, the Oak Cliff, who go across county or counties for low paying jobs when those housing opportunities for level wage earnings should be actually in Frisco and Plano. And Absolutely. I mean, I completely agree with you. It's it's uh, it's an issue that we have that we have to think about regionally. Um, you, is your program does your program exist in Frisco? Does Frisco have affordable housing programs? Does the have that? Uh, you know, I can't I can't answer uh, in depth about about what exactly they're doing. I know that there are uh, one of the groups that we mentioned, the Inclusive Communities Project, is is really <laughs> striving to make sure that there are. Uh, affordable options, particularly in their case, um, working to influence those cities to work with um, apartment complexes to accept uh, Section 8 vouchers, and um, they they tend to respond with the stick rather than the carrot. Um, they've, I know, brought a lot of lawsuits against those northern cities to try and encourage more affordability um, up there, but, you know, I mean, to your point, right, like, here's, uh, here's the tollway going up into Plano, there's tons of those jobs up there, um, and and lots of those the low income folks are here. So I mean, I think what we're talking about in terms of creating more affordable opportunities in East Dallas and North Dallas that are um, that are high opportunity areas, low poverty areas, close to jobs, has to extend to the region as a whole. It's not something that that we've done. Our current focus has been on how to how to accomplish some of these things in Dallas, but I think it's hugely important. Um, absolutely. Well, then I guess my advice to you is find out what the other communities are doing and craft some of your strategy more in a regional way because it does us very little good to be doing an excellent job in Dallas when our regional partners are doing nothing or very close to nothing. Absolutely agree with you. Thank you. Uh, I do, I, just to your point, sir, there, there is actually some movement on this in the city of Plano which you know, a couple of years back, very resistant to a concerted affordable housing development policy. And I think you've seen some pretty remarkable changes on that city council um, and some, uh, some really interesting development happening um, in their downtown, uh, mostly in the rental space. So Thomas, yes. um, you mentioned that you know, the housing committee is off thinking about this for having their separate sessions with Freck and ULI and, and all that. And, um, it doesn't seem to be that open a process. I mean, like, bringing lots of people together to talk about it. So how is your effort going to inform, guide, influence what's going on? Because whatever they end up deciding will be it for some period of time because it just takes too much time to go through, to go through this process. And I, I want to thank any of you that care about this stuff, you got to follow what the Housing Committee is doing and, and get involved because otherwise it will be whatever the institutional fabric of the city decides it will be. Yeah, and so tune in to the Dallas City Hall website uh, to check out those Housing Committee meetings. Not as entertaining as the Dallas City Council meetings, but very important. Um, no, to your point, I mean, I think, you know, one of the, I think, important things that we want to have takeaway from today is for uh, folks here to hear these ideas and hopefully get behind some of these ideas. I mean, really the concept of using data strategically and um, to help target the type of housing investment and, and the geography of investment for affordability uh, in the city is, is our big takeaway here. And we've gotten this in front of Scott Griggs. Uh, we hope to have an opportunity to present it to the Housing Committee. So uh, if any of you guys have the ear of any elected officials, Michael Veal, we appreciate you to send it in. Um, you know, you've been you've, trying to get them to be more precise about what the city's objectives will be about housing beyond housing plots. So you put more you know, legs on the whatever. 
Um, but you know, you, you, your metrics and coming up with the methodology, the city has no methodology. And you know, the housing department and housing plus are going through all these machinations. So in the absence of none, maybe again, if you can get Alan Sims and the establishment to listen, maybe you can help them craft something that can be used on a sustainable basis as opposed to the plan du jour every year. Sure. When, and, you know, we don't necessarily suggest that this is, you know, that those criteria are the perfect ones or that they can't be rearranged or weighted differently. As much as anything, it was a demonstration of we can start to be strategic and start to lay out uh, criteria for how we make those decisions. Um, and that I think in the long run is going to help us um, know better what it is that we're accomplishing and, or, or where we're failing and how to fix it. Um, so when I looked in the book, the one at the, uh, the plot on Fairmont and Little Rogers and the one on, I guess it's Ralph and uh, Roth in mm -hmm. um, the Spire Properties area. Mm -hmm. So you know I live right in between those. So I'm all for it. Um, the thing is, is how do we, how do we cause the city and challenging you and, and others to think about how we make them, force them to think about those kinds of decisions as opposed to, I know the, a lot of the land owners around there will fight it because they want it all to be high end and that's why we have no uh, activation vibrancy on the floor. Yeah, when I think it takes, I mean it takes, um, the city saying, um, taking a hard stance and saying, we, housing and urban development department told us you got to start integrating your neighborhoods better. This is a place where we have an existing asset of really high value. Um, we're going to put it to use to accomplish those goals, and we think it's going to be better for downtown. Economic integration. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Raj Chetty. Yeah. And, and, and racial integration. Both well, of them. But they That's hear. They hear different things when you don't, when you're not precise about it. Also, is the city still using the regional measure of income for its measure of low to moderate income as opposed to city of Dallas income numbers? I couldn't tell you for sure. I know that um, they've added, um, the, the federal government has added some levels of specificity to those measures, whereas it used to be DFW, then it was Dallas Plano Irving. And I know that like in terms of the fair market rents, you can actually do those by zip code now instead of by um, by the city or the region. As, as far as how they're applying it, I, I couldn't tell you. Melanie. So you probably have studied the ULI and uh, track studies a little bit closer than I have. But something that keeps coming out both in a, a meeting yesterday and, and you've been touched on it today, the kind of mortgage denial complex, you know, like if you're a, a moderate to low income person trying to be in a higher income level, you get denied. If you're a higher income person trying to get into a lower income, you're denied. Um, so that's one piece. And another piece is when you're trying to do low income housing at higher uh, levels of the city, it doesn't pencil out for, you know, say a developer, unless it's a, kind of a smaller 100 units versus 400 units. So I'm just curious, in these, all of these reports, is that issue of kind of the banking and the financial piece, and maybe this is a question for Annie too, <laughs> like, you know, are we, are we trying to advocate policy related to some of those barriers? Because it seems like it's a pretty key portion for those who are willing and able to buy in a different section of town or yeah. build in another section of town. And, and I don't know nearly enough about the inner workings of underwriting to understand how some of those things happen. And um, uh, I think that that's something that we need to, to know more about. I mean, I think that, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to speak too much to that. I, I mean, just on the, on the mortgage lending side, you know, something that came out of all the discussions with AIM was that, um, you know, there are actually some pretty good, so that there's the mortgage side, right, and then there's like the project finance side. Right? I, I know a little more about the mortgage finance side. But, you know, we actually have like some pretty decent products out there for low moderate income buyers by for-profit banks. City's got a really great product, although we're not a retail bank in this state anymore. But other banks have also offered great products, you know, for example, that don't have mortgage insurance. So we have products, but we kind of have like the wrong lenders 
for that population. So that, you know, I think that there is some discussion about um, having some new entrants in the first mortgage lending um, uh, in this market. You know, they exist in some other markets and they, they can be really successful. And these are not necessarily, you know, that there's market to be attained that I think banks would readily see because they're not well structured to serve, you know, a low moderate income buyer. They're not structured for a long term purchase process. So I, I do think there are solutions. I think it would require, you know, a community development financial institution to either, uh, in this market, to either take up a first mortgage um, product, and, and I think we do have one uh, in BCL of Texas that is planning to, to do that. And the question is, can they do that at any scale? And then can there be other entrants to help flesh that out? On the project side, project finance side, you know, you know more about that than I do. <laughs> uh, and I think, I think, yeah, we have to think about, the, first of all, AIM, you know, has also, as you saw earlier in what Patrick was saying, you know, there's this investment plan. There's, you know, and I don't think that BC Workshop claims to want to be the owner or the, the holder of any aspect of these plans, right? We all are going to have to partner together to fill these gaps. And so, um, on the investment side, you know, what, what investment fund, you know, can Trek create a, a, an investment fund that can help us, as we were discussing, you know, yesterday, um, can help us uh, hold property and bridge the gap in higher income areas? Um, can other entrants into the market bring in new investment dollars to help us do that? I have one other question. I know it's probably time to wrap, but um, related to uh, how early do you have to get in? So if you're trying to, like, um, get in before gentrification. Do you have a notion of the timeline of that in Dallas? Because it's, in my experience, that's tricky. If it's too early, then you kind of can be accused of doing low-income properties in low-income areas. And if you're too late, the land's too high to actually create a moderate income thing. Yeah, no, I totally understand. I mean, I, I don't know that we have a, a magic formula figured out for that yet. I think. Um, and, and I know that you guys um, at one point sort of were, were suffered from a place where you said, well, we're investing in a place that we think is going to get a lot of growth and then got pushed back because currently um, it's low income. Um, but um, I mean, I think that these sort of market analysis to look at how demand is spreading and moving about um, will do, do a lot to remove some of that sort of relying on uh, intuition in terms of where we think a market might be going and really, uh, really stake it in. This is how it's changing compared to the region. That seems like a decent bet. Something just occurred to me that this is a major skew to the market uh, regionally and especially for Dallas. With a lot of corporate relocations in and around Dallas, you have people moving in from the East Coast and West Coast where housing values are tremendously higher. So they would sell something that might go for let's say $100,000 here in Dallas, but they could get eight or 900,000 for it in Los Angeles or Washington, D.C. So they come, they sell there to corporately relocate here, and what would be an affordable housing price of, let's say, $200,000, you have these new people coming in with cash in hand, buying, and not even discussing the price, not even negotiating, how much of capacity, how much your supply gets eaten up by that group, and I think for the next five years, that's going to be the impact. Yeah, I couldn't tell you from that group in particular. I mean, I could say that because the inventory is so low, I know that um, uh, allows for some inflation of price beyond, you know, because the inventory is so low, what the house is actually worth um, is, is lower than what people are willing to pay for because it's so hard to find a home. I'm gonna let you jump in on this here. Well, I was just gonna say that there was a beautiful home on Denton, I'm Candy Evans of Candy's Dirt, and there was a beautiful home on Denton Drive that caught my eye and I went over there on Thursday to look at it. It had been a redone uh, small home over in that little Maple Springs area, and um, someone had purchased it and put a lot of money into it, sold for around <coughs> 450 and it sold over the weekend, so it sold in four days. So the market is extremely hot in, in affordable housing, anything under a million dollars. The market from a million and a half and up is starting to cool a little bit. So, uh, when, and one thing um, to follow up on that that was a, um, 
something that, that sort of confounded us when we first saw it. We were like, I think the data is wrong here, which was, um, you know, in, in uh, lower income neighborhoods, and I know that, that um, Jerry knows that this is a big challenge for affordable development, uh, is uh, having the collateral not appraise at what the developer needs to sell it for to be able to, um, right, to be able to recoup their costs. And this is from a, non from a nonprofit. But we also saw that, I don't know if you guys remember this, <laughs> that at some of, the, some of these higher priced homes, um, it was saying that they were getting mortgages denied for collateral, which we could only take to, to mean that um, the demand was so great for some of those houses at like three, four, five hundred thousand dollars that people were willing to pay more than what they were getting appraised that and the bank was saying, well, no, we're not going to lend to you at that. The house isn't actually worth that. Um, yeah, the situation uh, in new construction below south of 30, the appraisal system will not appraise the house at the construction cost level. So you have a gap for uh, the affordable homes being, uh, a, being affordable by a low income family. And it, uh, it continues to, uh, to be that way. Now, the market is appreciating. It, it is warm south of uh, the <coughs> and it's going up, but it is not going up at the same rate of the uh, rise in the construction cost. So if you build a house for $150,000, right now the appraisal system will come in with an appraised amount of uh, maybe 120, 125. So you have that gap, and where does that gap come from? Who pays for that? Uh, and right now, the federal government is providing subsidies to help, but there's only so much money to go to go around. And some of the mortgage companies are stepping forward, and they're helping with that, and they're helping with 100% financing. They're helping with closing costs, and that's very helpful. But uh, uh, until, and you hit on it in the presentation, it's the desirability of some of the areas. And if they appear to be not as desirable, then the appraisal system will bring the, the uh, price down. And we can only sell the house at the appraised amount. That's what we, we can't do any more than that. So it's a real challenge. Jonathan, do you have a question? I was in the back of slide 44. See, I knew I was needed to number the slides. So I was hoping you'd do that. I didn't have them numbered for the longest time, and I was like, oh, I There goes one that has very circled on it. Yeah. So just south of that last southernmost circle is a swath of blue which I believe means there are a lot of homes being bought. Now, am I wrong or is that basically off 45, uh, surrounding 45 and basically east south of the So, um, yeah, a couple things about this. One, part of this tract is, there's not actually a lot of people living in this tract or a lot of homes in this tract. Some amount of it is the forest. Um, but also, one of the things about some of these neighborhoods that um, they score higher on this trend, which means they've changed a lot from 2010 to 2015, um, which is something that the mayor sort of touched on last night, but didn't necessarily put it in context. Um, uh, a lot of this has to do with not just not necessarily in, if we broke it down into those three metrics: the num number of homes sold, the days on market, and the change in price. A lot of what this comes down to is, you know, if the average home sale in this census tract in 2010 was $20,000, and then in 2015 it was $50,000, that's a huge jump, and bigger jump than is happening anywhere else in the region. But it's still sort of, at you know, at the at the pretty low end. Um, so that that accounts for um, for this tract in particular. Now, some of this. Um, is, is less sort of anomalous in, in those changes. I'm very anomalous in this, but that could potentially include someone who's buying a house to rent, correct? Absolutely correct. And one of the slides that we had in here that 
took out because the first time we did this, I went for I just went on and on for like an hour. Had a had a <laughs> had a uh, had a slide that was um, single family percentage of homes in a neighborhood that are single family detached, but but renter. And in in big swaths of this area, it's uh, it's forty to fifty percent of all of the homes, any housing unit in the neighborhood. Uh, our rental single family, um, and and I think that's something to, to 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 keep in mind because this is coming from the MLS data, not from um, from some of these that we use the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data. Um, those are specifically owner occupied. Um, you can, we can filter those by owner occupied. Um, I'm not sure that we can do that in the MLS. Tell whether it's uh, a, an owner. Uh, purchasing the house or it's a landlord purchasing the house to rent out. So you're absolutely right. That could be part of that. And I think um, I think that's a big issue, too, is people who are looking at some of the, the things that are happening in these neighborhoods and um, investors that are getting ahead of homeowners that are getting ahead of the city's ability to, to, to impact those places. Yes. So other than being a historian, this point I'm going to make would be hard for you to catch up. But particularly in the southern part of the city, um, there are tracks, and you showed one, the, Je the Jeffries Meyer neighborhood, that are really not in a place where if you look at it, it looks like, well, we could build something. But it turns out you really can't because of what's below the ground. There are, there are wide areas uh, south of downtown that uh, have been badly polluted over the years. I mean, some of them are famous. Cadillac, uh, Cadillac Heights, with the, with the lead plants, and the West House with the lead plants. But that one right there, uh, City of Dallas Water Department owns a big vacant tract of land. <coughs> and the school district was looking for a site for, to build a new Billy Day Middle School. The first site we looked at was a site that took advantage of that tract of land. Now, between that tract of land and the rest of it is a forge, and it's the only forge that the company that owns it has in the country. Uh, and, and that forge is grandfathered in. But the city of Dallas tract is, had, had bad groundwater from some kind of commercial use that was there years ago, and the groundwater flows across and down all the Myers and Jeffries and all those blocks. And so you, you, you wouldn't know that until you started doing uh, uh, phase one environmentals or you started looking at stuff. And the whole area was the kind of brownfield by the city of Dallas uh, in the 70s, and then, they didn't, and then they didn't take the next step. And take the federal money to clean it up. Uh, so because of the history, because of the history of the city putting heavy commercial uses adjacent to all those South Dallas neighborhoods and West Dallas neighborhoods, uh, that the land, a lot of it is, is seriously, seriously compromised and would have a huge um, payment cost. And so what we did was switch sites to, to the current site. Uh, when and you're right, I, I didn't know that, and that's a good point. Um, and I, and I think that's a reason why we put this in this activation category in terms of those four, which is to say, it's not ready for a housing investment yet necessarily because the demand is not going to allow that housing investment to to occur efficiently. And so, what needs to happen here is different types of investments to to improve the land. So in this case, for that to, for that to work, and that is close in. And it's virtually empty. You drive by there, and it looks like almost like Prosper, except for the freeway around it, because <laughs> the land is, is all unclear. Uh, the city's going to have to the city's going to have to step in and get it cleaned up if, if it's going to become because because uh, the private sector can't do that. Won't do that. Sure. Uh, I don't believe. I mean, you're that. I mentioned there's a data source for all that too, right? So there's other that you should get going here. You know, yeah, and, and, and you know, you, you can look at Sanborn's maps, or you can look at uh, when you can get brown 
brownfield sites and site high pollution sites from. But you have to go look for that. Yeah, that's great. You're not going to be able to tell that just look at it. No, but that's a that's a good point to include into how you how you isolate where the right sites are. I'm just trying to do a lot of that in history. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. This was a great conversation. Uh,